Okay, well, here we are in session five of our series on Luke Acts, and we're going to be jumping in on uh, Luke chapter four, starting in verse 14. So we left off last, last time we were talking about Yeshua's immersion uh, in the Jordan River and how that uh, the experience that he had there uh, with the Holy Spirit coming upon him as he came out of the water, how that constituted his anointing, right? So if Yeshua is the anointed one, well, he has to have been anointed at some point, right? So um, this uh, subject of anointing is going to come up again this week. Uh, also, just uh, since if going back to the first couple sessions, we saw in the first two chapters of Luke this this strong sense of of uh, Messiah coming as uh, to to do all these uh, political, military, uh, redemptive kind of things, right? So Yeshua would sit on David's throne. Uh, God would deliver Israel from her enemies. Uh, the uh, in Mary's song, she talks about God bringing down those who are proud, those who are uh, the oppressors, which in first century Jewish context, that's the the Romans, right? And raising up those who are afflicted and those who are humbled, which uh, in that context is talking about Israel. Uh, so there's there's a clear a uh, sense of continuity with the promises in the Tanakh for a national restoration for the people of Israel that is uh, physical, political, and involves God establishing a kingdom and literally delivering Israel from her enemies. Uh, we also then in chapter 3 saw John the Baptist coming in with a, a bit of a different message, a message of repentance and a message of warning of coming judgment. Uh, and then Yeshua comes along, and as we'll see uh, in in this uh, session, Yeshua begins to teach. He begins to minister. He begins to uh, uh, perform healings. And I'm going to suggest that Yeshua's message is carrying on uh, the message of John the Baptist that Yeshua too is calling people to repentance, but he is also coming as a herald of good news. And we'll see some of those things come out today. So today we're going to look at the start of Yeshua's public ministry. And I want us to start with a question uh, before we jump into looking at Luke chapter 4. The question is this. What is the significance of Yeshua's ministry for believers today? You know, in, in evangelical Christianity, uh, we tend to place more emphasis on Yeshua's death than on his life, right? If someone asks, well, why did Yeshua come? The standard evangelical answer is he came to die on the cross for our sins, right? And, and uh, that's true. But sometimes, unwittingly, we de-emphasize Yeshua's life, uh, the significance of, of Yeshua living his life here on earth. What did that mean? Yeshua didn't come just to die, right? He came and he ministered to, to people for some three years first, right? He didn't just come to earth and then die and that's it. There's all these chapters in between Yeshua's birth and Yeshua's death that are there for a reason. So my question here is, why? What is that reason? And um, obviously Yeshua's ministry had a big impact on those he ministered to directly, right? Uh, the people that he healed, uh, the people that he taught. But what is, his, what is the impact on us? There's no right or wrong answer to this question, but I want us to brainstorm this a little bit here. What is the significance of Yeshua's ministry for believers today. Any thoughts on that? Why is it important that we have these stories in our Bible? I would say that uh, 
be sure the ministry would teach us one of the way to properly interpret the Torah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Yeshua teaches us the way to properly interpret Torah. What else? I think because he wanted to show compassion to his people by healing so many mm -hmm. the people they encounter. Right. He wanted to show compassion to his people. Wanted us to know that God really loves us. Right, and, yeah. And our lives with him is a love affair. Right. Yeah, those two really go together because, you know, um, we could say he wanted to show compassion to his people. Well, that that affected the people he ministered to. But how does that affect us? Well, um, like you said, Ken, that shows us that he really loves us as well, right? He came to this earth and he he loved, um, he, he displayed God's love here on earth. Anything else about why did Yeshua come and, and live and minister? What What impact does that have on our lives? I think also the passage in Isaiah, that's what he came for. To, uh, you know, the list, to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom, and so on and so on. Right. So he's he's uh, fulfilling, um, I mean, this, this could even be a broader category. He came to fulfill um, prophecies from the Tanakh, right? Yes. Mm. Um, but also, you know, to to preach and to and to heal. Yes, I would say Ben too that um, you know his ministry uh, demonstrates to us today that God does intend to keep His promises. Right. <laughs> Right, so demonstrates that uh, this promise-keeping aspect to God's character, certainly, yeah. Um, might I suggest as an example for us to follow? So Yeshua's life is significant, his, his uh, ministries, uh, you know, three-ish years, if we want to say that, these three years of ministry and, and the fact that they're recorded for us in uh, uh, some detail in the Gospels, that's there for us in part because Yeshua is an example for us to follow, right? Yeah. No, these are, these are all great answers. Any, any other answers before we move on here? Did anyone think of anything else? All right. That's great. Yeah, so so there is there's a reason why this stuff is in our Bibles, right? We don't just have the story of Yeshua's birth and then his death and then his resurrection and ascension and then just a bunch of theological implications. No, there's a uh, Yeshua came and lived a real life on earth. He uh, ministered to real people on this earth, and there's something for us to learn. From that. So we're going to be uh, diving into that a bit today. So let's go ahead and take a look at Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 30 and let's start by reading this whole passage, uh, all of verses thir uh, 14 to 30 and I'd like to get a volunteer. Uh, would anyone be willing to read that? I can read. Sure, that'd be great. Okay, uh, starting verse 14. That's right, yep. To how far? Uh, you can go all the way to verse 30. Okay. 
or verse 14. Then Yeshua returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and recover of recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went on his way. Great, thank you. All right, so um, Luke places this incident uh, right at the start of Yeshua's ministry. It's interesting if you compare it with um, both uh, Mark and Luke have a slightly different order. Uh, take a quick look at this chart here. Uh, this kind of gives an outline of the beginning of Yeshua's ministry. Uh, as it's told in the th uh, the three synoptic gospels. So we have all these different stories and I tried to color code it so that the same story is the same color for uh, all three columns. I don't know if that's more confusing than helpful, but uh, yeah, hopefully you can kind of make sense of this. So you'll notice that both Matthew and Mark uh, begin with Yeshua calling disciples. He calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John, right? Uh, Luke, we're not going to encounter that until after a couple other stories. So, uh, you know, Luke, and Luke puts uh, Yeshua rejected at Nazareth right at the beginning. The other Gospels have that story, but they have it quite a bit later. It's not even on this chart, actually. So, um and some other things of this of the order are a little different. Uh, so, Luke uh, in, in Mark's version, which is most scholars say is probably the oldest, and Matthew and Luke are probably relying on on Mark as a source for uh, composing their gospels. Uh, 
we have Yeshua chooses his four disciples and his first four disciples, and then the incident of he, uh, healings at, that take place at Capernaum, and then Yeshua cleanses a leper and then heals a paralytic. So in Luke, it has the exact same elements, but the order is a little different. We have um, he goes to Capernaum after first going to Nazareth, and he selects his first four disciples after he heals uh, a bunch of them, which is a little uh, a little interesting when you get to uh, in Luke 4, 38, it talks about how he left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Uh, if we've never read the other Gospels and never read Luke before, we don't know who Simon is. And we find out later in the story when Yeshua calls him as, as a disciple that Simon was one of the fishermen who becomes an uh, important disciple, Peter, Simon Peter, right? Um, yeah, so it, it does raise the question, you, you know, and I, I think Luke is is very intentional about what he's doing. He's not just slapping a bunch of stories together haphazardly in whatever order he wants. Um, there's a reason he's telling it this way, right? And and you'll see in, in Matthew, uh, again, the order is a little different, right? He has the Sermon on the Mount comes right at the, at the beginning of his ministry, whereas in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain, which is a close parallel, we'll look at that next time, uh, comes quite a bit later, right? So there's a reason why Yeshua fronts this story of, of, of Yeshua's rejection at Nazareth. We'll try to unpack some of that here. First of all, notice that at the beginning of the passage that we read, Let's go back to this slide here. All right. We've got, um, if we jump back to the beginning of our passage, verse 14, it emphasizes that, I mean, Yeshua is just, he's just left, uh, he, he's just been baptized and he goes into the desert. And he's uh, empowered, full of the Holy Spirit, it says, as he returns from the Jordan and is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This is Luke 4, verse 1. And then you jump down to verse 14, and again it emphasizes the Spirit, uh, the Spirit in his ministry. Yeshua returns in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And it it's not explicit here, but the implication is that he's he's preaching and teaching and and healing people right uh, so he's he's filled with the spirit in a way that people recognize it you know you read in in the tanakh all these places where the spirit comes upon so and so and there's a result right the spirit came upon so and so and he or she did such and such right so there's always a result when the spirit comes upon someone and it's and it's visible it's manifest to other people uh you know in in some cases, it's being able to rouse people together uh, to a military victory. And, you know, in the case of Samson, for example, it was uh, being filled with supernatural strength. In some cases, it's uh, being filled with a prophetic utterance to declare, things like that, right? So here we have Yeshua being filled with the Spirit, and it manifests itself in a way that people can see. And a report about him goes throughout all the, all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues. So Yeshua is being characterized here as a spirit-filled teacher. And that becomes significant when he comes to Nazareth. By the time he gets to Nazareth, there's already a report about him that's been going, going around, right? So, and, you know, by the way, this is actually the earliest... Uh, description of a Jewish synagogue service that we have. Uh, and another description comes in Acts 13, 15. So, so Luke is our earliest source on what ancient Jewish synagogue services might have looked like, because we really don't have a lot of information about them. If you look at Acts 13, 15, 
this is when Paul and uh, his companions are traveling around and they came to Antioch and Pisidia on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down after reading from the Torah and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying brothers if you have any word of encouragement for the people say it and then Paul goes on to give a sermon so it's kind of interesting that in if we put these two passages together we see uh, there's three main elements to the synagogue service at least that are being explicitly mentioned right there's the reading from the torah there's reading from the prophets and there's a sermon or teaching so uh, th there might have been other stuff probably they prayed too we luke doesn't specify that but we would assume that they did um, but those are those are the three things luke feels compelled to mention and they and they come up in both situation oh, well in in uh, our passage in Luke 4 it's not explicit that they were reading from the Torah as well as the prophets but it's implied right that first they read from the Torah and then uh, Yeshua came up to read and he read from the the prophets in this case it was from Isaiah and, and it's also interesting to me that in both of these situations Luke 4 and Acts 13 the teaching is given by a uh, visiting scholar of sorts. I, I know in, in this case, uh, this is Yeshua's hometown. So is he a visiting scholar? Or, well, he's, from the sounds of it, he's been away from his hometown for quite a while, and this is like a, a homecoming thing. But anyway, he's being acknowledged and honored as someone learned and given the opportunity to teach, right? And the same thing happens with Paul in uh, Pisidian Antioch in the book of Acts. And so the the sermon is given by this this visiting scholar. And by the way, um, note that the synagogues are not being led by rabbis at this time. Or, uh, rabbi was not an office like a pastor or something the way we sometimes think of it today. And actually, the earliest use of the term rabbi uh, is from the New Testament. the t The earliest documents that we have that use this word rabbi. Are, are are the New Testament and it's applied this titles applied to Yeshua and to John the Baptist so if you wanted to be historically accurate you would say those Yeshua and John the Baptist were the first rabbis <laughs> before that we have no record of the term uh, ever being used and, and it's being used as a title of respect a, a, res, a respectful term applied to a teacher right Ravi means my great one it's it's a it's like honorable sir or something like that right uh, it meant something very different than it means in later rabbinic literature where it becomes a technical term for someone who's ordained in the academies of rabbinic Judaism, right? It's, uh, it um, has a uh, sectarian kind of uh, bent to it in, in rabbinic literature, right? Um, and both of those meanings, by the way, are very different from the way the term rabbi is used today rabbi today is uh, sometimes especially in messianic circles sometimes people use it interchangeably with pastor you know a congregational leader well in first century the the leader of a congregation was not necessarily a rabbi and as far as we know uh, Yeshua and John the Baptist neither of them had a synagogue that they ruled over that's they weren't called rabbi because of that right Actually, there's this other term, archi synagogues. Uh, it's found several times in in Mark, Luke, and Acts. We see this term show up, and uh, archi synagogos is like a, a the ruler of a synagogue, right? Um, and it's uh, it it seems to overlap kind of with a civic sort of function a civic leader because just as the synagogue itself in the first century may have served uh, a civic function it's kind of like a community center right it's not just a house of worship it's not just a uh, house of prayer it's also a Beit Midrash a house of study and it's also just the community center right so the synagogue would have all the scriptural scrolls that you know m most of the people would not have their own you would be able to access the Bible, the scriptures from 
the scrolls that are at the synagogue. And then, of course, it says that when Yeshua was done reading, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Now, <laughs> if you don't understand the context, you might think, well, why was everyone staring at him when he goes back to his pew? Well, no, he's, the point is he sat down to teach, right? Uh, in in uh, this ancient Jewish context, a teacher would sit. And so so he sits down at, in, at, in a seat of authority to teach, and then he began, begins to teach, right? And all that Luke gives of his sermon is this, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> Presumably, his sermon was quite a bit longer than that, but that's that's the excerpt that we get. So let's let's unpack some of this. Uh, first of all, I want to compare a little bit with uh, the other gospel accounts of Yeshua coming to Nazareth. So all uh, the synoptic gospels all record uh, Yeshua coming and uh, coming to his hometown of Nazareth and and teaching them teaching in the synagogue right so Matthew talks about how he went to his hometown and taught in their synagogue and uh, Mark talks about that too right and in in all three cases there's this astonished reaction right like how did this you know this guy we know Yeshua how did he get to be such a great public speaker you know maybe he'd never they'd never heard him teach before that's uh, from the sounds of it right and the implication is that he Yeshua has come now in the power of the Holy Spirit and his teaching is dynamic right and and they recognize that but um, this this response that they have so Yeshua is the only one that actually, sorry, Luke is the only one that actually gives the content of what Yeshua read or taught. Luke tells us that he read from Isaiah and then commented on it. Right. Um, and then in Luke's version, all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words coming out of his mouth. In, in Mark... Uh, it says they're astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And, and uh, it talks about the mighty works done by his hand. Um, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joses, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So in, in Mark, right away, they're taking offense at him. And the same thing in uh, Matthew. Right away, they're taking offense at him. In Luke we don't necessarily get that impression, right? It's, it says uh, they spoke well of him. Uh, but then we get to, the, and they said, is not this Joseph's son? So it's, it's hard to tell. Does Luke mean to imply that uh, they're already starting to take offense at him a little bit? It doesn't quite seem that way, right? And then Yeshua says to them about this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Because apparently, uh, Yesh the word has already gone around about Yeshua's healing capabilities, right? We read it earlier in the chapter that a report went out about him and that people recognized something. So Luke hasn't explicitly said that he's been doing healings, but apparently report has happened about what Yeshua did at Capernaum. Yeshua's already done stuff at Capernaum and the report has come to Nazareth. So... Something changes, though. When we get to verse 28, suddenly they heard these things. They were all filled with wrath. <laughs> so, you know, the sermon started out okay, but then it uh, something went wrong somewhere in the process. And in, uh, in the other Gospels, it talks about how he did not do many works there because of their unbelief. Uh, in Mark, it says he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. You know, as as though that's that's just a little thing, right? <laughs> you know, that's that. I mean, to me, that sounds pretty amazing. But I guess compared to some of the other stuff, it's not that big a deal. And he marvelled because of their unbelief. So apparently, there's a bit of friction going on. 
um, over a number of issues. And one of them is the fact that Yeshua is performing miracles in all these other places, but he comes to his hometown and he's not. And why is that? And that may be one of the reasons why people are taking offense at him. We'll come back to that in just a second. First, I want to look at uh, this passage that Yeshua reads from, from Isaiah. Uh, back in session one, we talked about how there are some strategic places in the Tanakh where we see this, this term, basar, or evangelizo. Uh, in Hebrew, the word basar means to, um, or um, means to proclaim good news, right? In uh, Greek, it's the word evangelizo, where we get the word evangelize, right, or evangelism. Uh, the To preach the gospel, to proclaim good news, right? So this, this term shows up in strategic places in the book of Isaiah. We talked about uh, one of those strategic places in session one, and that's Isaiah 52, 7 to 12. Uh, in this passage, uh, we encounter another strategic place where this term is used. And that's in the passage that Yeshua quotes, right? So, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. There's, there's that term. So Yeshua, Yeshua understands that what he went through at the Jordan uh, to constitute his anointing, right? Um, to proclaim good news, right? Here's that word, uh, evangelisaste, to the poor. To proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, so, there's this, uh, this gospel that's being preached, this good news that's being preached, is going to come through an anointed one according to this passage. I want us to take a look at some of these passages in Isaiah. So Isaiah has these servant songs that uh, are well known. And in these, in these songs, Isaiah talks about this, this servant, servant of the Lord character, right? Let's take a look at some of them quickly. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold and whom my soul delights. I put my spirit on him. Right? Um, he will not grow faint or discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth and the coastlands will wait for his Torah. Right? Isaiah 49, 1-6, to six, Listen to me, O coastlands. Give attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He shaped, he, he named my name. Um, he said to me, down to verse 3, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And now says the Lord who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring be Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. Uh, and it goes, you know, on to talk about it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. In uh, the next one is Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord has given me the, wor the tongue of those who are taught. Isaiah 52, 13. Um, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. You know, I wish we could uh, stop and spend more time on these, but um, yeah, we will maybe come back to that another time if we get the chance. And then, of course, it goes into Isaiah 53, talking about this suffering servant. Then the last one, which not all, uh, not all scholars include this as one of the servant songs, but some do, and I, I believe it, it certainly uh, fits in. This is what Yeshua quotes. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God. It goes on. Now, a question that a lot of people have debated back and forth is these servant songs in Isaiah, who, uh, of whom 
is Isaiah speaking? Who's he talking about? As we'll see in the book of Acts, there's an Ethiopian eunuch that was wondering the exact same question. Who is Isaiah talking about in these passages? So, if we go back to um, Isaiah 49... Here it identifies it as Israel. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So apparently the servant of the Lord is Israel. This is at least the standard conclusion that uh, Judaism today comes to, that the servant of the Lord in, uh, especially uh, in Isaiah 53, this suffering servant, that that's just talking about Israel. Israel was su suffered so much and all these things. But there are a couple places where that identification doesn't quite work, because even in Isaiah 49, just a few verses later, we see uh, how the Lord formed me in the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him. Okay, so wait, is the servant Israel, or is the servant someone who's going to redeem Israel? And, of course, the answer is yes. There is a sense in which the servant of the Lord in Isaiah is describing the nation of Israel, but there's also a sense in which the servant of the Lord is describing the Savior of Israel. We saw this a little bit last session when we were looking at the temptation, how Yeshua is representing Israel. He's going through Israel's experience of going into the wilderness and being tested, right? Only Yeshua passes the test. Uh, in John, this comes out when it's talking about, in jo John 15, Yeshua says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and um, those who abide in me will bear much fruit. You know, he's drawing on language from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, actually, where God compares the nation of Israel to a vineyard, right? And is looking for fruit. But Israel failed to produce that fruit. And so Yeshua comes and says that he is, he is the true vine, right? He is the true representative of the nation of Israel who bears the fruit that God called upon the nation to bear. And we're going to see this theme come up uh, in, uh, in Luke and Acts, where Yeshua stands for the nation of Israel. And... Um, he has victory in, in the ways that Israel failed, right? So these are some important things to keep in mind as we're looking at these passages. Uh, and as we look at what uh, Luke is, uh, you know, recording that Jesus, that Yeshua is quoting from in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 61, right? This is, this is talking about Israel, but it's talking about much more than Israel. We'll come back to that in a future session, but I want us to keep that in mind that Yeshua represents Israel and we're going to see prophecies that apply to Israel also apply to Yeshua and vice versa in some important ways. All right. Now, this passage that Yeshua quotes talks about liberty or release, right? Talks about um, he, he's uh, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, what's interesting is this Greek word is aphesis. It uh, literally means release, right? To, to uh, let someone or something go or go free. Uh, but it's, it also happens to be the Greek word for forgiveness. In fact, every other instance of this word, aphesis, in Luke Acts, Outside of this passage, every single other time, it's translated as forgiveness. We saw this already in Luke 1, and in Luke 3, verse 3. I just want to go back to the, the one in Luke 1. This is in Zechariah's song. He talk, he's talking about, his, about uh, John the Baptist, right? His son. He says in, in verse... Luke 1, 
76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. That's this word, aphesis. Right? Uh, Luke 3, 3. John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness, the aphesis of sins. So, Yeshua is fitting into this pattern, right? Proclaiming aphesis, proclaiming forgiveness, right? Proclaiming uh, release to those who are in bondage, right? Uh, recovery of sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed. This is that word again, aphesis, to, um, to set them in aphesi. It's a different case. It's the same word. That's part of how Greek works. Um, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. By the way, what does this remind us of? Uh, like, like, what does this sound like? Liberty for the captives, liberty to the, the oppressed, the year of the Lord's favor. What, what, what does that sound like? Think number, uh, sorry, think Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25 gives us the laws about the year of Jubilee. Exactly, the Yovel, the year of Jubilee, right? And what gets to happen on the year of Jubilee? The, those who are enslaved are set free. Those who are in debt are given forgiveness of their debt, right? Their debts are forgiven. And by the way, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua reuses that imagery when we get to the Lord's Prayer. He talks about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is this is Jubilee language, right? <laughs> the forgiveness of debts. Um, this is where Israel gets uh, their inheritance restored, right? Israel's inheritance is restored. So there's a lot packed into this passage, right? Um, what does it mean when Yeshua says, in the brief little excerpt of his sermon that, Yeshu that, that Luke offers us, he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In what sense has it been fulfilled? Has the year of Jubilee come? Has the redemption finally been accomplished? I don't think that's what Yeshua means, and I don't think that's what Luke intends us to get out of this either. What it means is that Yeshua, by standing there in front of Israel, preaching, is fulfilling this passage. Yeshua is that herald. Yeshua is the anointed one who came to proclaim good news to the poor, to, to uh, evangelize the poor, right? He's the one that, that came to proclaim God's liberty. And so it's Yeshua's ministry that is fulfilling this passage. And in fact, this, this, this uh, passage from Isaiah becomes pro programmatic for Yeshua's ministry. This is a summary of what Yeshua is about to do. And Luke's going to give us in detail Yeshua doing this. He's preaching, proclaiming the good news, right? And he is healing. So those are... Um, the two aspects of of what this is what this is about, right? Uh, Yeshua came to teach, to proclaim the good news, and he came to heal, right? And these are the two things that Luke highlights. All right, um, one last thing in this passage I want to to look at before we move on here, and that is. Notice how, at first, opinions seem fairly positive towards him, right? But then, Yeshua quotes that proverb, Physician, heal thyself, right? The people at Nazareth want to see Yeshua perform uh, miracles like they've heard him do at Capernaum. And... As the other Gospels make clear, Yeshua is not able to do much at Nazareth because of their lack of faith. And so Yeshua gives this interesting reply. He says, Truly I say to you, 
no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And by the way, all, all four Gospels have this saying. <laughs> they all mention this. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. There's some variations on how it's worded, but it's the same basic saying. And, and then uh, Luke is the only one that includes this next part. I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah and um, talks about the famine, but that Elijah ends up not ministering to the widows in Israel, but he ministers to a, a, a Gentile widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And there are many lepers in Israel, but Elisha doesn't cleanse any of those lepers. Instead, he only cleanses this Gentile, Naaman, the Syrian. So the point uh, the that has a bit of abrasiveness here in, in these words is the fact that these two people are Gentiles, right? So what we're getting here is a hint of Yeshua's ministry and the message that Yeshua is proclaiming going out to the Gentiles. Now, we're not going to see this uh, developed until we get to the book of Acts, but this we're getting a, a foreshadowing here, right, of a theme that's going to be very important when we get to the book of Acts. But there's a, an important question here, and that is, does, does this mean that Yeshua is going to abandon Israel and go to the Gentiles, right? Or, or to put it more bluntly, does this mean that God will abandon Israel, right? This, this pertains to one of the three major focuses of this study that we talked about in session one. Uh, who is God's people for Luke? As far as Luke is concerned, who is the people of God? Does Luke believe that Israel has been replaced by Gentile believers? Because you could see Christians who believe in replacement theology looking at this passage and saying, yeah, this is saying that God's going to turn away from Israel and he's going to go to the Gentiles. Uh, there are several reasons why that can't be the right answer and why that can't be the conclusion that Luke wants us to come to. First of all, um, Yeshua does not cease ministering to his fellow Jews, right? In fact, his ministry pl takes place exclusively among Jews. Uh, we don't see Yeshua going to the Gentiles and healing. In, in fact, it's interesting, Luke, uh, Matthew and Mark both include a story about Yeshua going to the area near Tyre and Sidon and there's a, a woman there who's pleading about her daughter and at first he's brushing her off saying you know I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel but then she says you know humbles herself and says you know even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table I think you know the story Luke doesn't include that story. <laughs> it's interesting because it, it would fit in very well with what, Yesh what Yeshua says about Elijah was sent to Zarephath, the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. You know, you'd think including a story about Yeshua doing a similar thing would tie in. But that's not the direction that Luke wants us to take this, right? Luke doesn't want us to take this as implying that Yeshua's ministry is now going out to Gentiles because it, it doesn't in the story. That's not how he develops it. So that's the first point. Second point is even Elisha and Elijah don't cease ministering to their people. They're forced to go to, like for Elijah, he's forced to go to Sidon because of the rejection and persecution he's facing in the land of Israel. In the case of Elisha, um, <laughs> that's actually a really interesting story about Naaman and, uh, you know, thinking about God's uh, sovereignty even over Israel's enemies. I mean, at this time, Naaman is from Aram, and he's the the uh, chief official for the king of Aram, and Aram is Israel's worst enemy at this time. And yet God uses this uh, Hebrew uh, slave, this girl who is taken as a slave and serves uh, Naaman's wife, and uses her to share about the good news about the God of Israel that brings Naaman to come to the prophet Elisha. And it's, it's just a really cool story when you think about uh, God's sovereignty over foreign nations and willingness to be involved in, in these things and, and how that plays into the gospel. 
uh, yeah, there's there's lots we could talk about there. Um, so so there is there is a sense in which this is giving us Yeshua's words are giving us a foretaste of what we're going to see more of in Acts, and that's going to be developed in more detail. But it's not meant to be a rejection of Israel, and in fact, in the context here, it's giving the reason why Yeshua leaves Nazareth and goes to Capernaum, and the majority of his ministry is based in Capernaum. That seems to be his his new headquarters instead of Nazareth. Um, so it's not about leaving Israel to go to the Gentiles, right? So we talked about how Luke places this story at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry where the other Gospels place it later. I think one of the reasons is because this story really encapsulates the message of the the entire Gospel in one story, right? Yeshua comes preaching good news. He comes to his own, his own people, but his own reject him, right? His own friends and relatives, those who know him so well, are the ones who reject him and he ends up being acclaimed and accepted by others instead and and that's that's a pattern that we see repeating itself in in Luke and and well and in the book of Acts as well all right um i want to do a bit of a summary of some of yeshua's teaching and healing that goes on in the next couple chapters uh, we're not, you know, we've been spending a lot of time on these early chapters, but uh, we're going to have to uh, be a bit more selective in our treatment or we'll never get through this series. So um, instead of reading all the stories, I just want to summarize them here. We see Yeshua acting in the role as teacher, right? He taught in their synagogues in Galilee. He's teaching in Nazareth. We see him teaching in Capernaum on the Sabbath with authority. He talks about how he wants to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, uh, preaching in the synagogues of, Ju well, uh, some manuscripts say Judea, but other uh, manuscripts say Galilee. It's probably talking about Galilee, uh, just because we don't see Yeshua in Judea at all, really, until his final uh, ascent to Jerusalem for the final Passover, which will talk about when we get closer to that um he's teaching the uh the crowds by the sea of galilee uh great crowds gather to hear him talks about him teaching in a house teaching in a synagogue on the sabbath teaching a great multitude so he's just doing all this teaching right uh, and note that yeshua does a lot of teaching but so far luke hasn't given us very much of the content of Yeshua's teaching. Uh, unlike Matthew, as we saw, Matthew begins Yeshu talking about Yeshua's ministry with the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters just packed with uh, this amazing teaching, right? Uh, Luke, we'll get to that later. Luke will, will present a lot of the same material that Matthew presents, but uh, so far we haven't seen that. So far, Luke is telling us about all this teaching that Yeshua is doing, and uh, the actual content of that teaching we're going to get in in pieces as we go and you know maybe luke's setting us up to anticipate that more right we're we're anxious to to hear what it is that yeshua has to say um and what is yeshua teaching this whole time though uh, before we uh move on even though luke doesn't give us the content uh, it says at the end of chapter 4, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So what he's preaching, the, the teaching and preaching he's doing is the good news of the kingdom of God. That's something that we're going to be unpacking as we go through more of Yeshua's teaching um, but this, uh, you know, you want to sum up what is it that Yeshua was teaching this whole time? The good news of the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, we'll look at that in, in future sessions. So Yeshua is a teacher. Yeshua is also the healer, right? We And and these chapters uh, show lots of, I'm just looking at Luke, Luke chapters 4 to 6 right now, right? 
we'll we'll look at other chapters in in future sessions but so far in Luke 4 to 6 we see him casting out a demon in the Capernaum synagogue we see him healing Peter's mother-in-law from a fever healing many of various sicknesses and demons cleansing a leper great crowds gather to be healed healing in a house um healing a paralytic healing a man with a withered hand on the sabbath and healing diseases and casting out demons in a great among a great multitude remember um in this passage from isaiah that yeshua quotes he says i've come to proclaim good news to and then he mentions a certain socioeconomic status. What was that? Did he come to preach good news to the rich? No, he came to preach to the poor. I want to take a quick look at this chart. Um, this, this chart is taken from uh, Joel Green's commentary on the Gospel of Luke. And it's entitled, A Graphic Representation of the Relationship Among Classes in Agrarian Societies. <laughs> or uh, you could also say this is uh, representing the social stratification in the Roman Empire. So if you see, this, this chart basically shows a big pyramid, right? A big triangle. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a graphic representation. So up and down, uh, the higher you go on this graph, the higher in power and privilege you are. And the lower you go on the, gra on the graph, the lower in power and privilege you are. Uh, going left to right represents the approximate number of people that would be represented in that category. So the idea is that on, you know, like a triangle, the bottom has, is wider and the top is very narrow and skinny. Uh, so there is a lot more people at the bottom of the social ladder than there are people at the top. That's the way it's always been. But especially back then, uh, this dynamic was very pronounced. The majority of people in society are peasants. They're, they're you know, close to the poverty line, just barely scraping by to get a living, right? Um, on the sides... You have uh, your your merchants, which are uh, they sort of are on a spectrum of power and privilege, right? You've got some merchants that are higher up and some that are lower down. Below them, you have artisans, right? The people who are manufacturing stuff. Between peasants and the governing class, you have retainers and priests, right? So so the peasants would never have opportunity to interact directly with the governing class in society. Uh, their, their retainers uh, are the go-betweens in society, right? So like, like priests and, um, you know, servants of those in, in governing classes and, and uh, public officials, uh, public servants, things like that, right? Below the peasants, you have the unclean, the degraded, and at the very bottom, you've got the expendables, right? Uh, life was tough back then. <laughs> at the very, very, very top, high up above the, top, the highest pinnacle of <laughs> the governing class, you have the emperor. The emperor stands above everyone else in society, and e everyone else is underneath him, and he's... he's no one can touch him, right? He's he's so high up in power and privilege. So I feel like this is helpful for getting a just a sense of, you know, the world in which Yeshua was ministering was very poor. I mean, you compare it to modern standards. I know, I know there's still a lot of people in poverty in the world today, but I want to suggest it was not, it was nothing like this. The world in those days was very different, and the vast majority of people were incredibly poor. And these are the people that Yeshua is preaching to. Um, remember, in 
in Mary's song, right? She talks about how God's bringing down the 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 rich, bringing down the haughty, those who are full. And he's raising up those who are humble and afflicted. He's raising up those who are oppressed, uh, lifting up the hungry and filling them with good things. And um, at the end of the song, she makes clear who she's talking about there. God's re God is remembering Israel, who's poor and oppressed and lowly. And this gives us kind of a visual uh, for what that oppression and lowliness looked like, for, for just how poor Israel was in these days. So, we see Yeshua came to proclaim freedom. He came to proclaim forgiveness, release, right, to those in oppression. And, and this message, you know, the, <laughs> the message of God's release, the message of God's uh, forgiveness is att most attractive to those who are lowly, right? Think of, think of the message of the, the Jubilee year. Right? Who are the people that that were really excited about the Jubilee year? The people who have who are in debt, right? Who's going to be excited about the the uh, the forgiveness of loans? <laughs> the people who have them, not the people who are rich and lending out money, right? The people who are in debt are the ones that are going to be excited about it. Who are the people that are going to be excited about uh, everyone getting their land back? The people who have lost their land. Who are the ones that are going to be excited about captives being delivered? The people who are in captivity. There is a sense in which Yeshua's message of good news is good news first and foremost to those who are lowly, to those who are in a low position. And we're going to see this dynamic come up uh, next time as we enter into Yeshua's Sermon on the Plain or Sermon on the Mount. Um, we'll be looking at Matthew and Luke in that sense. But Yeshua comes down hard against those who are arrogant and those who think that they're self-sufficient or they don't need God's help, right? And Yeshua talks about how he came, um, this is in chapter 5, he says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The way that Israel responds to Yeshua's message is going to affect uh, the applicability of the message to them. Right? If you take a haughty stance, a self-righteous stance, you run in danger of defining yourself outside the scope of Messiah's mission. Right? Yeshua came to save the lowly. He came to save, deliver the oppressed. He came to proclaim forgiveness to those who are in bondage and who need God's forgiveness. And, and this is a message for us, right? <laughs> we have to be those who are willing to humble ourselves and acknowledge our need for forgiveness. Um, because if we take a self-righteous attitude, then we define ourselves outside Messiah's mission. All right, I think we'll close there. 